So over the last few days, a number of people we featured on the channel, including Jordan Hall and Brett Weinstein, were kicked off Facebook and no reasons given. Brett was later reinstated after quite a big campaign. Probably helps if you've got nearly half a million Twitter followers. I got a warning that said that I had been removed from Facebook, that a review had already been conducted, and that there was no path to being reinstated. So I posted an image, a screenshot of the warning to my Twitter feed, which has a great many followers, and it went viral. And it's not just these big names, there's many others as well. So I was off Facebook. I had a multiple accounts, one for my business, two, two or three for my businesses. Um, those were gone and inaccessible because they were linked to my personal account. And then I went to check into my Instagram, which my Instagram accounts are purely business. Uh, I don't use them personally. I'm a carpenter and a painter. So I just had projects, uh, pictures of pa painted walls before and after basically. And uh, those were gone. And that account had a similar boilerplate, which actually told me there was no appeals process. The reason that we're having this conversation, Leo, is I, I know you, like we've known each other for a good couple of years online. And I, I would say that you are kind of probably IDW adjacent, like you were, you were campaigning for Yang, like you, you're not sort of politically active. You, you haven't, from everything that I've seen of you, you haven't been posting anything let alone kind of even inflammatory, let alone kind of border, bordering on kind of going against terms of service. Yeah. Um, and, and that's why I feel sort of comfortable, um, yeah, saying that I'm, I, I can't see what you could have done. Um, could you describe your politics and what you think is going on? Yeah, I mean, the, the best guess is, um, and this is not just through, through me, but through talking to people in my network, but also folks outside of my network, um, so my network of friends on Facebook, um, we, me and two or three other guys who got also had the same thing happen, um, who also had their business accounts destroyed and eliminated, which were not related in any way other, other than that connection. Um, we run and moderate and admin a number of groups. Um, so we have some number of reach, some amount of reach. Uh, one of the groups we admin is one of the larger Jordan Peterson groups. It's been on for five years, which we now can't access so we've been basically talking to folks behind the scene it does seem like this recent um wave of purges has been hitting uh, quote-unquote conservatives um but i wouldn't call myself that um but it does seem like i got caught up in whatever dragnet um or algorithmic process um caught my friends um jordan hall and brett weinstein um and a few others are certainly not conservatives either so and what do you think is going on well i'm getting all kinds of reports. Some of them are coming over the transom from people I don't know who are saying effectively the same thing happened to them. And many of them are asking for help. And I don't exactly know what to do with these things because I don't know who's asking. I don't know uh, what the underlying story might be. But I do have the sense that a lot of people are facing some kind of authoritarian purge from the, pro from, uh, the platform. And that what I saw was... Uh, was perfectly appalling. I also know that closer to home, people who administer groups associated, for example, with the Dark Horse podcast are also reporting strange removals with no justification. And uh, I think there's some, this is so non-random that obviously something political and full of content is taking place inside Facebook. Yeah, I mean, this is the concerning thing is, it was interesting. I mean, we, I did a, ser a series a while ago about and included like Barry Weiss, for example, at the New York Times. What was interesting is that the 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 main battles seem to be between people who are um, largely on the left or on the liberal side, but but are sort of counter the woke narrative. It's not conservatives necessarily. It seems to be the people who are yourself, for example, or Jordan Hall, people who are skeptical of the mainstream narrative, skeptical of the woke narrative, they seem to be the ones that are more dangerous, I think, or seem to be being targeted. Yeah, this is my inference too. And it's not that conservatives haven't faced a lot of this stuff, but I think it's been 
lower level and longer standing. And that what's happening now is actually directed at people who are specifically inconvenient for the mainstream left narrative by virtue of being decidedly left and yet not accepting most of the premises that are being advanced. I mean, the thing that I'm confused by is why now? I mean, so close to the election, we were talking, this happened like a couple of days ago. Um, it it sort of seemed to make sense that maybe in the months leading up that there would start to be purges. I know that both you and Eric have talked about that, fearing that it would happen in the run-up. It seems very, very close. Like, it seems almost uh, difficult to understand why a couple of days before this might happen. Well, there is one obvious interpretation, and until I hear a better hypothesis, it's, it's the one I assume is taking place, which is that the noise surrounding the election itself is actually covering what would otherwise be a major story. And so I think they are preparing for a future battle. It's too late for them to be doing this from the perspective of affecting this election. I mean, even though it could technically do that, it is too late for it to have maximal effect. So what I suspect is going on is that they are using the chaos around the election to cover the fact that they are going to engage in authoritarian behavior that would otherwise cause a major outcry. I spoke to my um, friend Leo de Forge, and he not only was, so he's a, a Yang supporter, very much kind of um, ID, into kind of some of the ideas of the IDW. He's the moderator of one of the Jordan Peterson groups. Um, a, and very... Not only was he, did he have his Facebook account disconnected, but he also lost his Instagram account, two Instagram accounts, and both of them were business oriented. So he's basically lost all of his business accounts at the same time. So this is quite serious. It's not just kind of the, the, the lack of ability to kind of discuss ideas or to go on Facebook and argue with people. It's also accounts that people have spent years potentially setting up with, with a lot of value to their businesses there as well. Yes, I, and it's going to be hard for people who don't make a living through these mechanisms to understand how dire these losses can be. But the fact is the, the ability to earn, one's livelihood can come through agreements with these platforms over which one has no protection. And so, yes, you can be financially ruined in an instant if some discussion behind the scenes decides that you are inconvenient to a political narrative that they want to advance. And uh, it, it could hardly be more dangerous. Do you have any thoughts? Because some of the theories I've seen out there are that they're targeting specifically admins of groups because then that group, if it doesn't have an admin, can then be either taken over or shut down. Do you, yeah. Do you buy that or not? Yeah, it's certainly possible. I mean, the thing I'm trying not to do is just speculate. So I'm happy leaving things somewhat unknown now, but the reality is, is they'll probably be unknown for probably forever um, because the idea that we'll ever get any kind of adjudication or trial here is obviously laughable. Um, so uh, it's a, it's, it's, it makes kangaroo courts look bad. Uh, the echoes of draconian authoritarian regimes of the past are hard to miss if you're aware of how authoritarianism works. So all I can say is that this isn't exactly like any historical example, but it's very similar to many of them. And the key distinction for us here in the U.S. is that although we have formal protections for our ability to associate and to speak and believe as we wish, those protections do not extend to private concerns. And so the fact of the public square now living on private servers means that the, the protections Americans have gotten used to have quietly vanished. And this is the result. Yeah. I mean, can you say more about that? Because that feels like a very important point that maybe people are not because we get we get distracted into these conversations around, well, these are private companies. They're able to do whatever they want. And that's on one level, that's true. But on another, another level, the fact that these private companies have devoured the public space is in itself part of the problem. Yeah, it's, it's the core of the problem. So the American founders feared the government's ability to silence people. And that's because at the time, government was the only thing powerful enough to do it. 
And so they built protections that specifically protected Americans from governmental obstruction of these rights. Had they understood, though, that these technical conduits were going to come to dominate our ability to talk to each other. I mean, even the conversation you are, and I are having would be so mind-blowing in the context that the founders were discussing what should be in the Constitution, that it's no surprise that they missed that this needed protection at least as much as the protection against governmental interference in speech. So it seems like one of two things has to happen in order to protect the things that the founders understood were central to this uh, pluralistic society that they, they prototyped. One is that we have to have a public square in which the access is public. That's one possible solution. Or we have to regulate the privately, uh, privately served public square so as to protect these rights, despite the fact that some aspect of the, um, the mechanism is bottlenecked through private concerns. Rebel Wisdom isn't only about the ideas in the films, it's also about how we bring them into our lives, which is why over the last few months, we've invested in developing the Rebel Wisdom community, our digital campfire. We've launched a new platform for discussion and connection, started regular meetups and practice sessions for members, plus Q&As with some of the amazing interviewees we've had on the channel, and our Wisdom Gym with some of the biggest names in growth and transformation. So if you'd like to support Rebel Wisdom to help us continue to make films and to find the others, maybe think about joining the Rebel Wisdom community. Thank you for watching.